true heroes remembered. Survivors and brave souls are honored 70 years after the D-Day invasion. He's no hero. That's what men who served with Sergeant Bo Bergdahl are saying about the released captive. A pause from politics. The Pope says Sunday's prayer meeting in the Vatican Gardens will not be politicized. And California Chrome could become the first Triple Crown winner in more than three decades. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Friday, June 6, 2014. Good evening from Washington. Thank you for joining us for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. We begin looking at news now. Today marks the 70th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, a day that changed the course of World War II and modern history. Leaders from across the world came together at Sword Beach on the Normandy coast today. French President Francois Hollande, Queen Elizabeth II, and German Chancellor Angela Merkel were among those who came. Veterans from the Allied countries sat patiently in the sun, umbrellas offering some relief from the heat. President Obama spoke at the morning ceremony after meeting with surviving D-Day veterans. We tell this story to bear what witness we can to what happened when the boys from America reached Omaha Beach. By daybreak, blood soaked the water, bombs broke the sky. Thousands of paratroopers had dropped into the wrong landing sites. Thousands of rounds bit into flesh and sand. Entire companies worth of men fell in minutes. Hell's Beach had earned its name. After the president's speech, U.S. F-15 fighters took to the sky in the missing man formation. Well, it was a morning to reflect for the surviving D-Day vets. The now peaceful Normandy beaches hold vivid wartime memories for the men who landed here. Exactly 70 years after members of the 29th Infantry Division stormed Omaha Beach under enemy fire, surviving veterans gathered at dawn to reflect on their unit's sacrifice. A beautiful new statue was dedicated in their honor. We have a bond that is eternal. We went through life-changing experiences during those extraordinary war years, the American Army and our French allies. Those events shall live with us forever. Their numbers are dwindling, but these veterans represent what we have come to know as the greatest generation. Why? Probably because we were willing to die for, for the freedom of other people. 90-year-old Don McCarthy from Maryland says he's blessed to be alive knowing that so many died on these beaches. A very special moment in my life. I'm so filled with joy right now. I can hardly control myself. Tell them what it looked like here. You know, it didn't look like it did this morning. Thanks, guy, for being here. Today, McCarthy and his fellow brothers from the 29th are honored while remembering the men who died in battle here. I asked God that I would do everyone I needed to do in my life to get me off the beach. And he sure is dead. Yeah. Brought me here today. You know, the whole bunch of us that, that, that were fortunate enough that God blessed us to get here. And back here in Washington today, veterans were honored at the National World War II Memorial. Relatives of former Presidents Eisenhower and Roosevelt hosted the event in the National Mall along with the friends of the National World War II Memorial. EWTN News Nightly caught up with several groups who came to Washington in honor of our veterans. And when you ask them, what did you do? They say, I didn't do anything. And I think that's just the, the, the humility that our World War II veterans have, uh, you know, how humble they are, how appreciative they are of everything that this country has. So just great day. Well, every day I think uh, when I have the occasion to meet a World War II veteran or especially to celebrate their mass Christian burial, which are happening in record numbers now because of their ages, uh, it reminds us of the duty that they embraced. As part of the ceremony today, representatives from each of the Allied nations that took part in that battle at Normandy laid wreaths at the Freedom Wall. On this momentous day, we're joined by a renowned historian and author, Craig Simons. His book is called Neptune, The Allied Invasion of Europe and the D-Day Landings. Craig, great to have you with us. Thank you, Brian. Happy to be here. This is an incredible day. We are remembering 70 years ago the, the sacrifice made by thousands of young American soldiers. Describe the scope of the D-Day invasion. Well, it's nearly unimaginable. I mean, over 6,000 ships. In fact, the one most iconic memory that 
connects all of the people who participate in this is that view of those, that ocean of ships uh, stretching out, filling the Bay of the Seine with 6,000 warships, transports, landing craft, Higgins boats, rocket firing craft, almost every ship imaginable. And of course, by the time it was over, they brought 176,000 on that first day, but in the end, over 2 million men across the channel for that invasion. And now in that peaceful area of France, there are these rows and rows of gravestones, which indicates how deadly this was. The first waves of this invasion, they almost had no chance. Well, especially on Omaha Beach. There were five Allied beaches, two British, one Canadian, two American. And Omaha Beach, one of the American beaches, was one where geography and circumstance combined to make it an extraordinarily difficult target, and that is where the really awful moments took place. But in order for the, the invasion to be a success, and history shows that it was the turning point in the War of Europe, in order for that to be a success, there had to be that number of men, and I'm sure that many knew that they would never come back. Well, obviously, someone has to go first. And among the most uh, vulnerable in this are the Naval Combat Demolition Teams, NCDT, uh, who went ashore to blow up the obstructions, and here are mined obstructions on the beach, and they come in with sacks full of C2 explosives over their shoulder, wading ashore through machine gun fire to put explosive devices on these already mined objects. Uh, I think they knew before the day began that their likelihood of surviving was very minimal. There are only a few of the veterans left. They're in their upper 80s, early 90s. They were teens and early 20s at the right. time. What can we do today to thank them and to remember all those who well, sacrificed. Well, the word that you just said, remember. We need to remember this. This is 70 years now. That's a biblical lifetime, three score years and 10. And so we're on the, the, at risk, I think, of forgetting the sacrifice that these men made uh, to keep the world free. And that's the most important thing we can do is remember. And of course, you served as the master of ceremonies for the program here in Washington today at the World War II Memorial. I'm sure I that did. was very, very moving. moving. Yeah. Very moving. All right. Uh, Craig's book is Neptune. Craig Simons, thanks for joining us on EWTN News. Thank Night. you, Brian. Now, some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. We're learning more tonight about the soldiers swapped for five Taliban fighters. The Pentagon says Sergeant Bo Bergdahl is improving at a German hospital. Today, we've also heard more from the Taliban and from soldiers who served with Bergdahl. Jason Calvi is following that, developing a story. Jason? Brian, we were hearing today from three soldiers who served with the sergeant in Afghanistan. For five years, they've struggled with that. What really happened to their team member? Five years of questions for Evan Buteau, Sergeant Bo Bergdahl's team leader in Afghanistan. For all of us who are there, we need closure so bad. It's the same question many Americans are asking tonight. My name is Bo Bergdahl. How did Sergeant Bergdahl end up in Taliban captivity? It's almost exciting that hopefully we'll get that closure when he is able to say what happened. Whatever that may be, we don't care. But even when and if Bergdahl says what happened, these vets seem to have already made up their minds. He didn't serve with, with honor and dignity and respect, and he is a deserter in a time of war. We're here to say he's not a hero. We know exactly what happened. We were there. Gerald Sutton was also there five years ago. It kind of hit me a little bit harder because I was considered his good friend. There was two or three of us that were also pretty close with Bergdahl. So overall, the platoon, like, it was kind of a lot of shock and some anger, too. And, I mean, he just kind of just walked off on us. And Sutton remembers something he says Bergdahl said, some words that could have just been a joke. But he said, uh, what would it like if I got lost out in the, wood, uh, on the, the mountains? Or do you think I could uh, walk to India or China on foot? And I just laughed at it. And he kind of seemed to smirk and laugh it off, too. But Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel says we shouldn't jump to conclusions. He says the Army will review the case. President Obama has added that no matter what the circumstances, he says it's a sacred duty to get our men home. Brian? Jason, I understand the Taliban is also talking a little bit more about how they treated him while he was a captive. That's right, Brian. The Taliban says they treated Bergdahl fine. They said they fed him fresh food, uh, fresh fruit. They said he was able to read books, including on Islam. And they even said that Bergdahl was able to play soccer with the Taliban. All right, Jason Calvi, thank you tonight. Well, today the Ukrainian Border Service released a video that apparently shows the aftermath of clashes between pro-Russian rebels and Ukrainian government troops at a border crossing with Russia. 
An aide to the Ukrainian interior minister said at least 15 pro-Russian rebels were killed in the clashes on Thursday. He says armed men from Russia tried to cross the border at a village in eastern Ukraine with support from 100 rebels on the Ukrainian side. Following the clashes, Ukraine's government ordered the closing of parts of the border with Russia in an attempt to prevent armed men from infiltrating Ukrainian territory. Thousands of Jordanians gathered near the Israeli border today to mark Al-Quds Day or Jerusalem Day with demonstrations also held in Gaza City and Jerusalem. The day marks Muslims' claim to Jerusalem, considered the third holiest city in Islam. Protesters near the border chanted anti-Israel slogans and held banners in support of Palestinian resistant movements. A little later, we have a report coming up from Rome on the preparations for the prayer meeting with Pope Francis. He is hosting the Israeli and Palestinian presidents in the Vatican Gardens on Sunday evening. Well, ahead of tomorrow's Belmont Stakes, California Chrome's co-owner is speaking out about his horse. This chestnut colt is only the 12th horse to reach Long Island with wins in the first two legs of the Triple Crown. The Kentucky Derby and the Preakness since 1978. We're just glad we can share this story with people because it, I, we just hope it gives other people the incentive to go out and try hard. And, uh, you know, you can make your dreams come true if you're willing to put hard work into it. And uh, that's exactly what we did. Racing insiders say if California Chrome becomes the first Triple Crown winner in 36 years, his breeding value is likely to be between 15 and 20 million dollars. Well, the nun has won. Sister Christina Scucci is the winner of Italy's version of The Voice. The 25-year-old Ursuline sister of the Holy Family received 62% of the vote. She's walking away with a universal record contract. Her performances are a huge hit online. Her audition's been viewed by at least 50 million on YouTube. The singing nun, as she's called, reserved her final thanks for the one up there. Coming up, prayer matters. How Sunday's prayer meeting in the Vatican Gardens can help bring peace to the Middle East. And our Rome correspondent, Alan Holdren, tells us how people in Rome see Sunday's meeting of heads of state. From the official Twitter page of Pope Francis, this prayer, peace is a gift of God but requires our efforts. Let us be people of peace in prayer and deed. Welcome back to EWTN News Nightly for this D-Day, the 6th of June. And uh, this evening we have more details about Sunday's prayer meeting with Pope Francis and the presidents of Israel and Palestine. During his trip to the Holy Land, the Pope invited them to come to his house to pray for peace. Organizers say they'll meet outside in the Vatican Gardens. There will be separate prayers for the different religions. They are emphatic that this is a religious ceremony, not a diplomatic maneuver. Father Pier Battista Pizzabella, one of the event organizers, said that they'll be taking a pause from politics. My hope uh, that uh, this event will help uh, to bring a new atmosphere of peace in the Middle East. It's also confirmed now that Greek Orthodox Patriarch Bartholomew I will be there along with Holy See, Israeli and Palestinian delegations. We've been following this since it was announced during the Pope's trip to the Holy Land. Our Alan Holdren was there in Jerusalem with the Holy Father. He's joining us today from Rome. Alan, what sort of dynamic is there between the presidents and the Pope at this point? So this, uh, these encounters between Pope Francis and these two presidents have taken place individually in the past. Just in the Holy Land a couple weeks ago, the Pope visited them each in their separate lands. They've both come to visit him also in the last year and a half in the Vatican, each separately. This time they'll be coming separately, but they'll be meeting with him together and amongst themselves. Now this, uh, for the Pope, is a, a major encounter, but he said it's not for negotiations. It's not to propose solutions. It's just to meet together and to ask God for peace in the Holy Land. Now, uh, for, for the, the Pope and for these two, this encounter will be groundbreaking. And certainly there is power in prayer. We all know that. What are people there in Rome saying about this meeting on Sunday? They're saying that this is an extension of his trip to the Holy Land. This is really the exclamation point, the conclusion. Now, uh, there are no expectations for what could come from it, but there is an archbishop, one of the closest uh, collaborators with the Pope inside the Vatican, who says that the Pope in this encounter is going to bring God into the equation. Pope Francis has invited the two presidents, Abu Mazen and Paris, to Rome to his house to pray for peace. With this sentence, I'm saying everything. Prayer is stronger than diplomacy. One needs to realize this. I think he has wanted to give an example of this reality 
above all of this fact. Of course, we'll be bringing more about this to you from Rome on Monday. Back to you, Brian. All right, Al. Thanks a lot, Alan. Melissa Bronstein, a writer and cultural commentator, is with us. You recently wrote an article that you mentioned that prayer matters. Do you think that this prayer meeting will matter in the Middle East process? I think it will. Um, I think it can only help many people around the world find that it's very helpful bringing their struggles to God, and I think that can only be all the more true in a situation as large and complex as Middle East peace. And I think that having someone as holy and as righteous as Pope Francis leading this prayer can only be helpful. So you are Jewish. I wonder what you think of those images of Pope Francis at the Western Wall and then hugging his friend, the rabbi, and another friend who is, who is a, a Muslim. What does that do for you? I loved it. Mm. Um, God may be everywhere in the world, but there are certain places where you feel his presence just so much more strongly, and the Western Wall is absolutely one of those places. So watching the Pope deep in prayer, deeply engaged, and then running over to hug his friends, was very meaningful to me. I saw someone who felt very awed and even possibly overwhelmed by the experience, which I could relate to, and it made the Pope seem very human to me, and it made me like him even more. He is a very genuine person, and just to watch him, you can see that his heart is in this. Mm -hmm. None of this is for show. I know right. some of the secular media would like to present it that way, but his heart is truly in that, and that matters, doesn't it? Absolutely, yes. So. When Francis met with the Holocaust victims there at the uh, Israel's National Holocaust Memorial, that was very touching too. What was your take on that? Uh, I found the whole thing very moving. Uh, for most of the world, I think the Holocaust is ancient history, but Israel was born from its ashes. And I think for Israelis and for Jews around the world who lost family in the Holocaust, myself included, it was very meaningful having the Pope visit Yad Vashem to be there. I found him very loving and and very genuine with the Holocaust survivors that he met. The compassion that he showed was very impressive. I was also impressed by the moral clarity with which he spoke about the evil that men are capable of. And my one hope is that the Pope will be inspired by this visit to go out and continue speaking against anti-Semitism, which is again a rising threat in Europe. And that is certainly part of his mission in this whole unity uh, mission that he's on, and we pray for the success of that. Melissa, thank you for joining us tonight. Absolutely. Well, thousands of Italian Carabinieri police officers met with Pope Francis at St. Peter's Square today. The square was so packed with these officers, it looked a little more like a general audience. The pontiff urged the officers to always be with the people, and he told them that their vocation is that of service. The Holy Father then announced that he will go to Italy's largest military shrine in September to pray for all those who have died in wars. This year marks a century since World War I began. Up next, blurring fiction with reality. How online fantasy can encourage violence that's all too real. And veterans share their memories 70 years after their D-Day landing on the Normandy beaches. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. After an alarming crime in Wisconsin tonight, we take a closer look at what some kids are doing online. EWTN News Nightly's Katherine Zeltner reports. Here in these woods of a Milwaukee suburb, a young girl was found fighting for her life on Saturday. The victim of a disturbing attack, allegedly stabbed by two of her classmates, two 12-year-old girls at a nearby middle school. Prosecutors say the girls had planned the attack for months. According to court documents, the two plotted to kill their friend to please Slender Man, a demon-like fictional character on a horror site called Creepy Pasta. I've never seen anything like this in, in a 30 plus year in education. Todd Gray is the superintendent of Waukesha Public Schools. The district has brought in crisis counselors in the wake of this tragedy. They're also reviewing their internet policy. We've obviously blocked that site at this point. I don't think anyone was aware of that. According to the documents, the girls lured the young victim to the woods where they stabbed her. The girls told police they plan to, quote, run away to Slenderman's mansion after the killing. The attack prompted the author of the horror site to write a disclaimer on the page. Quote, there is a line between fiction and reality, and it is up to you to realize where the line is. The two girls have been charged with homicide as adults. Lawyers are fighting to move the case to juvenile court. Katherine Zeltner, EWTN News Nightly. 
Dr. Neil Bernstein joins us now to discuss this Slender Man phenomenon. Now, this guy, this character, blurs fiction and reality. For these 12-year-olds, how difficult is it for them to see the line between the two? You know, it's intriguing because all 12-year-olds are not created equal. Some kids are much more susceptible to buying into that stuff than others. And clearly, the more a young person is blurring those distinctions, the greater the risk. So we're really talking about upbringing, good judgment values, and a combination of things that build the character that determines the reaction to these things. Well, let's get into the underlying factor here. That This site, when you go to this site, it says, this site hosts your worst nightmares. Why would people put these sites up, and what is the attraction, especially for young people? Well, you know, it's like the forbidden fruit mm. when you say that to a 12-year-old. Whatever you do, don't look at this. That's all we have to say. It just sucks them right in. And from the standpoint of whoever's behind these things, you know, you want to make it alluring. You want to make it addictive. And that's one of the problems we all face as parents, how to combat this and what, what to do, you know. So monitor and there are a lot of things involved here. This horrible situation where two 12-year-olds attack another 12-year-old, can that be blamed on this online character or what other parts play into this? Well, the way I look at it, all 12-year-olds are not created equal. Some are far more susceptible to these kinds of graphic videos, violent videos, et cetera, et cetera. And we know now from research that the more risk, the more at risk the child is, the more problematic the child is, the more likely they are to become followers of this, and, and in your worst case scenario, to become perpetrators for these kinds of things. And it behooves all of us as parents to know what our kids are doing and know what they're watching. So we don't have to be at the mercy of the internet when it comes to our kids. What is it that parents can and should be doing to make sure they're aware of what their kids are into and how to react to that. Well, for starters, we need to know our children. And I always tell parents, our job is to be able to enter through the child's door and take them out through our own, which basically means we need to know their world. We need to be talking to them. You can't, quote, have that one big talk and expect to get great results if you don't have an ongoing close relationship with your child. The less you feel like you know your child, the greater the risk. So, so what are we your tasked child. with as parents? Talking to our kids on a regular basis. Know your child, and we have to let them know us, too. Well, That's part of a relationship. Yeah, practice what you right. preach. Dr. Neil Bernstein, thanks for joining us tonight. Pleasure. And finally tonight, we bring you a few more stories from D-Day, June 6th, 1944. Many of those who survived that longest day, 70 years ago, have felt compelled over the years to bear witness for those who didn't make it. As their own candles now begin to flicker, that need burns fiercer than ever. I've thought many times D, the D in D-Day meant death day. I don't care how tough you are, it gets it. it it gets you. Uh, every D-Day, specifically on that day, I don't forget who was there and what we were doing. The odds of surviving were so slim. And to survive is, was uh, something unbelievable. Of course, we're all, all nervous. And we could see down, look down, we could see the silhouettes of the ships. And what I said in there, of course, was that when I saw all those ships, I said, well, if you have any doubt about it now, you look down there, this is going to happen one way or the other. Every man that came, uh, came through that machine gun fire and landed on Omaha Beach, every man was a hero. If they talk about heroes, these guys knew when they walked into that machine gun fire, what it was. And you could actually see the channels of machine gun fires in a beach. And you had to be lucky to be between those channels of fire. We were about 400 yards off the beach when an 88 artillery shell hit my boat. It was blown up in the air. All I remember is the boat going up and over. I cracked my skull against the bulkhead. Next thing I remember, I'm laying underneath this rock wall on the left flank of Omaha Beach. Two men 
I was told, dragged me ashore. The weight we had on our back, we'd take one step and slide back half a step, take another step and slide back. Bodies all over the front edge of the water. They're just laying there, bobbing. I mean, what a, it's amazing how you can be so immune to feelings. You know, you just look and it goes with the program, you know. When I go to cemeteries, as often as I've gone there, it gets me. It, it still gets me. I can feel it right now. When Company C that waited ashore on Omaha Beach, and today, by my count, there's only four of us left. It had to happen or had to be successful, otherwise we'd be somewhere else today, maybe saluting Hitler, I don't know. Uh, I hope not Mussolini anyway. All those years now, 70 years, hasn't erased any of the, the uh, feelings that we had for our soldiers there, our buddies that we'd been with, and to see them uh, die there will never leave, never leave your mind. God bless all of our veterans and all who died fighting for a free world on D-Day 70 years ago. Thank you for watching tonight. We're back on Monday. Until then, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or catch us again on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Good night and God bless you.